much, and thank you for to those of you in the audience. We are a select group today, but I understand that we also have a large number of people sitting at the other end of where the camera is leading, so that's also nice to know, even though we cannot interact with them, obviously. So, I've been asked to talk essentially about the jurisdiction of the court in relation to foreign, uh, com common foreign and security policy, CF. SP, and that could be a very short intervention because uh, the answer is there ain't none. But that's, of course, not the full truth because uh, if we are looking at one of the very active areas that I was invited to speak about when I was here last in April for the previous conference, uh, there is the right of the union to sanction, or rather in the new speak, to adopt temporary restrictions in relation to certain persons and countries, and those are acts that may be challenged, as we'll be looking at in, in some detail here. So in some sense, for those of you who are here in April, this is the prequel to what I was saying in, in April that now comes as, the, uh, as a sequel rather than as a pre prequel. Enough of that. So. First, I need to look slightly at the legal basis, and that's why I have a set of slides that, that restates or, or, or quotes some of the articles from the uh, treaties, but with uh, a, uh, an underlining to draw your focus to the important things. Now, the first conceptual issue that's often uh, causing difficulties is that we have now a less clear division than we had originally. On the other hand, it is set out in a way that should be very clear, but people still often get it wrong. Uh, the provisions we have in the Treaty of the European Union are now the fundamental provisions about the institutions and the policies of the European Union. And then because the member states still wanted to have uh, a foreign policy, if I call it that in short, but it covers for a common foreign and security policy, but they still wanted to have foreign policy as an intergovernmental option rather than a uh, supranational option, which has always, for, for me, been such a curious uh, uh, political ambition uh, because essentially the member states were saying, we do not want the court involved in this issue. And then you ask them, but what is it you want to do? Yeah, we want to enter into an, a binding agreement, but we want to have our own right to decide whether we implement it or not. So, in other words, you want to enter into a contract, but you reserve the right of breach of contract, and you don't want the court to be involved in checking whether there is breach of contract. To me, it's utter nonsense, but for the politicians, it apparently had attraction value in relation to speaking with their national electorates, and therefore we are still settled with it. But that is not all that we have put in the, uh, in the Treaty on the European Union. We have put something we now call external action. And uh, that's also why we have a, what has become an independent institution, uh, the European External Action Service, which is, uh, in my opinion, a rather poor name because at least I link back directly to the French uh, uh, splinter group called Action Directe, uh, which was essentially, you could say, a terrorist or uh, or organization and therefore not the best of names for the new foreign ministry of the European Union. But never mind. But like a national foreign ministry, it does cover more than foreign policy because, for example, the Danish foreign, foreign ministry also deals with international trade and also deals with international development assistance. And that's exactly it. External action is a broad scope of international relations uh, where the uh, European Council must define the strategic interests uh, and it's then specified explicitly that this concerns the common foreign policy as well as other uh, areas. Now, uh, that's all ve very well. What is then going to happen in this field? There we go. I, it's underlined again in these provisions that cover the whole area that it's going to cover all fields of international relations, including support for human rights and the rule of law. So that can actually be part of foreign policy, as the court has also uh, confirmed in its case law, but it can also be seen as part of international development policy. So it will depend on the instrument at hand, whether it is one of or the others. And the, it is on the union, and 
effectively on the uh, European Council to ensure that there is coherence between the different policies of uh, external uh, action. Now, what legal instruments are then available? Uh, well, uh, the Council may adopt uh, decisions concerning uh, relations with a specific country. But what are then the procedures for these decisions? Well, in general, references made to the procedures in the treaties, and, and that will say the Treaty on the Functioning of the European Union. So, in other words, we have the whole set that we'll be looking at briefly of legislative and non-legislative procedures and legislative and non-legislative instruments, except, as we'll also see in a moment, in the field of foreign policy, where we have special procedures. But if we are not in a field where there are special procedures, we fall back to the general framework of the treaties. Now, the general framework of, of, of the treaties is also one where I can follow the conceptual logic that the treaty writers had, or rather that the poor German secretariat had when they tried to cobble together the remaining pieces of the constitutional treaty into what then became the Lisbon Treaty. And they came upon, upon this notion of separating between two kinds of rules. It's just, again, in my understanding of the English language, the most utterly useless concept that has been uh, defined, namely to distinguish between legislative acts and non-legislative acts. Uh, because a non-legislative act, by ordinary linguistic understanding, would be something that was perhaps a specific decision in an administrative case. Uh, but to use it in a wider sense is almost to bend the, the language beyond natural uh, boundaries. But in any case, the legislative procedure is easy to identify because even whether it's a, an ordinary or a special legislative uh, procedure, it is one that will always involve both the Council and the Parliament. So that's the one thing we know. If the output does not have both the Parliament and the uh, Council involved in its adoption, then it is not a legislative uh, procedure. And then just to make sure that we all uh, understand it, the Secretariat noted, please note that an act that has been adopted under the legislative procedure is a legislative act. Wow. That's a heavy conclusion. And then comes the problem that where do we then have a definition of what are non-legislative acts? Well, we don't have any definition. We barely have any uh, reference to it. The only thing we have is the indication that we can delegate to the Commission to adopt non-legislative acts. But they must be seen as the two elements of a whole. So therefore, by logic, anything that is not qualifying as a legislative act must be a non-legislative act including, for example, in the field of common uh, foreign policy, where it will be quite frequently the council that acts without involvement of the parliament, and therefore they will be adopting essentially a non-legislative act, uh, even though it will be a binding act all, uh, all, all the same. We've made the distinction that we don't need to go into here, that the commission can then both adopt uh, uh, delegated acts and... Uh, implementing acts, which is not really new, but it has given some conceptual clarification, even though it has also brought with it new uh, issues of interpretation that have been at the pleasure of the court. Now, as far as the court's jurisdiction is concerned, and that's, of course, uh, the, theme, uh, uh, the theme name for my intervention today, uh, the court has got full jurisdiction over EU acts as a point of departure if no other limitations are put. And Article 263 is very, very broad. And uh, we mentioned there that it may check the legality of legislative acts, but we don't mention anything about non-legislative acts. But we do mention acts of the Council, which, if the Parliament is not involved, will be a non-legislative act. So, again, the wording could have been a little bit more helpful for, for, for the non-informed reader, but we have at least implemented the case law of, of the court effectively, namely that it doesn't matter what we call it. If it is an act that is intended to have legal effects, 
then it is an act that can be challenged before uh, the Court of, of Justice. And it also doesn't matter who has issued it, whether it's one of the named institutions or whether it's one of the bodies, offices, or agencies of, of the Union, which is another, uh, what can you call it, legal technical uh, default. Uh, at least in the Danish language, we have a good word. We have public authority which is something that will cover anything within the field of public administration, whether it is a body, office, or agency. But we don't have that word in the English language of the treaty, and therefore we always have to have this whole series of names. And uh, lo and behold, it's not even consistent as we move from article to article which of them are actually named as examples. But the point is, anything that's created institutionally by the EU is subject to this jurisdiction. Now, as I already mentioned, in the common foreign and security policy area, we uh, have done that uh, slightly differently. Uh, the, we have a definition in Article 20, 24, and that's where something magic happens. Now we shift out of the general chapter on external action, and we move into the special chapter on common foreign and security policy, and we say it shall cover all areas of foreign policy. And that, of course, again, brings a difficulty. What parts of external action would we not say were foreign policy? What, when, when does something be, come to be just external action and not a part of a foreign policy stance? Isn't it a foreign policy element to decide which countries in Africa to provide aid for, for, uh, for example? It becomes a little bit complicated. Uh, and the court has been rather broad in accepting a, a wide understanding of what can be foreign policy. It can in the future, or, or it does already include the common defense policy, and it can lead to common defense, a very touchy subject for some member states, including my country of origin, Denmark. But that's not our uh, here. And again, now we get a specific legal provision. So forget all about legislative and non-legislative acts for a short moment. Uh, under Article 20, 29, the Council shall adopt decisions uh, that uh, con concern the various elements of foreign policy. Because that is then highlighted in Article 20, 24, the common foreign and security policy is subject to specific rules and procedures. And just like the, uh, the uh, member states did in the, uh, in the Maastricht Treaty when they developed the so-called second and third pillars, and where they said very directly or indirectly but very clearly to the court, okay, we can live with the fact that you came up with direct effect and a lot of other principles, but you're bloody well not going to do it in the new pillars. So, uh, so therefore we are going to write in the new pillars that uh, whatever is adopted in these pillars can never have direct effect and see if you can get around that one, Court of Justice. Uh, and something similar here is the adoption of legislative acts shall be excluded. Now that's of course on the one hand a limitation, but on the other hand it also shows that, that this thing about special procedures in common foreign and security policy is not really true. So we are, in other words, referring back to the types of legal acts that are defined in the uh, TFEU, the Treaty on the Function of the European Union, because otherwise this reference would not really make, make sense. So for all intents and purposes, uh, the only limitation we have is one that comes on screen in just a moment. But first we need to pass by Article 40, which is a balancing act. It used to be a priority act in the previous version where it was Article 29 of the Treaty of the European Union, which said the new areas, including common foreign and security policy, shall not invade on the internal market rules. Now we've taken the step slightly different with Article 40 as it stands now, saying there must be a balance between the two. And that means that there are certain elements of the court's case law that could be revised today if it was uh, if somebody wanted to uh, to do that where the court had ruled specifically that because of the priority of the internal market then uh, then uh, that balance uh, it was not a matter of balance but uh, of of saying it must be adopted under the internal market provisions 
Uh, the balancey, uh, or, or the balancing act, or, or the demarcation act, the court has dealt with for many years, even before the Maastricht Treaty, such as in case 4586. It's not me who's missing a C, but the Cs didn't appear until uh, the Maastricht Treaty in 92, where the question was whether you could use international trade policy or whether you had to use the extra uh, authority at the end of the then EC treaties to adopt certain acts, uh, and where uh, the, the, uh, the question was development policy, does that fall within trade policy? No, it does not, and therefore, uh, according to, uh, to the Council, it was necessary to rely on the special authority in the then Article 2, 235, about which the Court said, actually, the fact that an Act involves also elements of, de uh, of, of development policy doesn't mean that it is not trade-related because development can actually be part of a general trade policy uh, in helping the developing countries, can be something that also has an impact on the trade policy of the European Union, and, uh, and, uh, and therefore uh, uh, the, uh, the conclusion of, of the Council was in the uh, actual case not correct. And if we jump forward to uh, the post-Maastricht times, then uh, Commission versus Council, uh, the famous case of environmental liability in, in criminal law, where the, the, uh, com uh, where the uh, Council had uh, tried to be very judicious and say, well, actually, since we now have a special pillar dedicated to criminal, to home and justice affairs, including criminal law, let us separate the waters entirely and say anything that deals with the environment will put under the internal market, anything that deals with sanctions, criminal law sanctions for violation of these rules, we will put in the, uh, in the uh, pillar for home and justice affairs, which in many ways was a logical approach. But here, under the pre-Lisbon rules, the court still was bound by Article 29 and the priority principle, and therefore it said no, actually, to the extent, a little bit like the case we were just looking at with development policy, to the extent it's possible to fit it in to the internal market rules, then you cannot go to the, uh, to the, uh, to the home and justice affairs field, and that's what, what I mentioned as an example of something that might be given a different interpretation uh, today. The only thing the court said was, there is, however, a borderline. So if you really want to regulate what specific penalties must be imposed, then it's true. Then you are crossing into the uh, home and justice affairs. So that means the end result became something very equivalent to what the council had done. The council had just thrown all elements of criminal law into a separate uh, document. Now it was only specific elements that had to go into the separate document. Whether that really created clarity, I'm not sure, but at least that was a very notable judgment at the time. Now coming back to the common foreign and, uh, and uh, common foreign and security policy, there we are very explicit that no, the Court of Justice does not have jurisdiction. So that's still the, the old exclusion, but except for two things. Exactly, the Balancing Act, Article 40, that can be checked by, uh, by the court. Uh, and secondly, the legality of the decisions provided by Article 275, and that's, of course, the sanctions, and thereby we connect to that issue. That's then repeated in uh, the Treaty on the Functioning of the European Union, uh, where it becomes... Essentially, it is the same thing, except it, re it, it refers explicitly to the legal basis in Article 263 for such a uh, test of validity. Uh, now, just finishing with the, uh, with the legal basis, that is then the basis for adopting these acts that are part of common foreign and security policy, uh, or rather their implementation, uh, when we've adopted the common foreign and security policy decision that we want to impose restrictions or sanctions on countries or people, then that will be a CFSP decision, but it will probably need, in most cases, an implementation in the internal market rules in order to apply directly 
to, uh, to uh, enterprises uh, operating either from abroad or within the European Union, and therefore we have a specific legal basis for adopting that implementation legislation in the Article 215. Now, one of the cases that came up before the court was then, with all of this, where we are very explicit, writing Article 263, yeah? we, we, we had that specifically, that it could be tested in, uh, under Article 263. What if somebody said, well, actually, my problem is the way my national authorities are implementing these rules against me, so I'm going to take them to national court. I'm not going to go and, and challenge the issue at the Court of Justice in Luxembourg. The question was, did the court have jurisdiction or not? Which was then settled by the Rosneff uh, case, where the court quite logically said, well, the two bases for testing the validity of EU law, whether it's by a direct action or by a, a um, preliminary reference, are actually equivalent. And that has been said uh, many years ago, that these are alternative routes that serve the same purpose. And therefore, it would also, of course, be uh, uh, very unwise to come to a conclusion that a preliminary reference would fall outside the scope of the jurisdiction. And therefore, uh, the, yes, indeed, we can have such, uh, such uh, a ruling. And just to be sure that, that nobody came back and said, but this is a misinterpretation of the literal text of the treaty, uh, the court, for good measure, threw in Article 47 of, of the Charter, which requires access to justice, and therefore uh, that further supported that, yes, this was possible as part of it. Okay. Coming to the second part, and coming also towards a conclusion, we are, we, when, when did we start? We started at 12.10 or something. So I've got 10 minutes. That's good. We'll do. Who can bring cases before the court under Article 263 if we look aside from the uh, Rosneft? Well, that's written very clearly in, in the text, even though it's not perhaps the most beautiful language. Uh, you can bring cases for a, an act that's addressed to you. So if you were subject to sanctions or temporary restrictions, you would be the addressee and therefore you could bring a, 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 a case. Or if you can prove that something that is not addressed to you is of direct and, and individual concern to, to, to you. And there, of course, the challenge has always been to prove that something was of individual concern uh, because nobody really paid much attention to direct because uh, the issue would typically be foreclosed by lack of uh, individual concern. So, for example, an EU regulation that you may disagree with, no, you cannot challenge it because it's not written individually to you and if it's written in a correct manner, it does not individually concern your affairs. You can try to prove that it does so, but that's a very uphill fight that few people have succeeded in. And then we came up with a new concept that you could challenge a regulatory act, which is of direct concern, but not individual, and which does not entail implementing measures. Again, I can, I can almost see visually what happened. The good Germans, this is my inter interpretation, the good Germans set working groups in different rooms and they each wrote their different parts of the treaty, and at the end, somebody in the Secretariat put it all together, and somebody forgot to mention, by the way, nobody else has defined what a regulatory act is. Uh, and that, of course, again called for the court to define that in the Inuit case, which I'll not go into the details of. But the court, quite correctly, first the general court, but uh, Inga has left us, but first the general court, and later confirmed by the Court of Justice, came to the conclusion that, uh, yes, a regulatory act is any act that is non-legislative and of general application. So that means that, essentially, you could argue that the acts uh, of, the, uh, of the council that, in general, set uh, a, um, a framework for restrictions could be seen as regulatory acts and, therefore, would be open to in individual challenge by a person if they could come across the divide of showing that it was a direct con concern. Because that's what happened with the court after it got this nice new provision. It all of a sudden re-awoke, re uh, well, 
it returned to the issue of direct concern, which had been left dormant for, uh, for many years, and all of a sudden it was seized upon by the court. Almost again, in my ima imagination, I see the, uh, the, the, the people at the court saying, what a nasty draft has opened with the new version of Article 2233. Could somebody close the door, please? And that's what was done in the Borax case by, by, by saying, what happened here? Well, it's about chemicals, it's ECHA in, in Helsinki, and it's somebody who's complaining that because of restrictions on the chemical, his customers will now no longer be buying his product. And, and uh, what the court answered, or the general court answered, was that, well, that then concerns the customers, because they cannot buy your product, but it does not directly concern you because you're not, you can still produce your product as much as you want, your customers just can't buy it. And to me that has never been very convincing logics. Uh, but uh, that was a demarcation uh, line drawn in, in Borax and it's not been uh, overturned as far as I've been able to, uh, to, um, to see currently. <laughs> so, then there is a time limit. Two months for bringing a, uh, a case. I've always been of the personal opinion that this was a Miss Foster. Uh, but it's been with us since uh, 1957 when we got the first Rome Treaty, the EC Treaty. I've always been of the opinion that, that, that you can't ask people to act within two months. It doesn't make sense. In my country, Denmark, the general time limit used to be five years. It's then been shortened to three years uh, in most uh, relations. Uh, but to have these ultra-short periods, we have them, for example, in uh, public procurement. It's in the public procurement legislation and it's happily now also uh, implemented in Denmark in the Danish public procurement legislation. But as a general rule, it means that everybody has to be on their marks and fire immediately, uh, and you can't really, so, so to say, piggy bag on somebody who success, successfully took a case to court, got something overturned, and say, well, me too. That was tried in the famous Woodpulp cases, and where the court said, no, there is no me too here. Uh, if we look at the uh, council reg reg regulation in relation to Iran, an older reg regulation, there you will see it says as an obligation that uh, there must be, first of all, of course, according to the treaty, a publication in the EU official journal. Secondly, there must be a notification to the individual, a letter brought personally to that person, you are now included. And if you can't find them, then the same standard as is applied in most countries, that you can then have a notice put in the official journal. Now, what took some people by surprise was what does that then mean in practice for my time limits? Because we have in the rules of the court a general rule that says the reading time, so, so, so to say, for the official journal is two weeks, uh, and that is then added to the time limit. But when does that apply? Does, does it apply in a case where there's also individual notification? Uh, and what the court said, no, that would be an unfair treatment. I'm not quite sure if I really understand why it would be unfair. I've, I, I've, I've never seen that point. But that was at least the rule, and amongst other lawyers, I myself got caught out on that one. Uh, we came late with an ap application, uh, and uh, of course you can say, well, you could just have submitted it earlier to avoid the problem, but that's not how the real world works. So that means that if you receive something as a notification, then you know now I've got two months only plus the 10 days for, for distance, which uh, still are, uh, are kept. But if it's not, then it's from the publication. That, of course, also means it's not really addressed in the Quebec book case. What then, when it was a publication in the official journal for notification purposes? But it's kind of implicit in the judgment, or it's fudged at the end of the judgment, that that must also uh, entail the, uh, the 14 days, because the court ends the judgment by saying, in any case, since the application was submitted in July, and all of this happened in February, then it was uh, out of bounds, uh, without any, any point. Uh, and uh, what the court then followed up with, or the general court followed up with, was to, to say, 
no, you cannot do what the council immediately said. Ah, but then we'll just, in all cases, immediately when we adopt restrictions, we'll also make a publication in the official journal because then we are covered. If we can't get hold of people, then retroactively this one kicks in. And the court told them, no, that's not possible. You first try direct communication. If that's not possible, then you may insert your notice. You can't uh, insert a blanket no uh, notice. Uh, because that would, pre 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 that, that, that would diminish the rights of uh, people. Uh, final issue, inapplicability, and then I, I shall terminate. Well, not, not terminate, but I'll end my presentation. Uh, that's the option that, that you can raise after the time limit, it, it says, very helpfully. You can raise after the time limit a, um, an issue uh, before the court but only in relation to an act of general application. So that means that if something was addressed to you, notified to you, uh, then we're out of bounds. But if, if you're addressing general rules, then you can do it. And that could, of course, in principle be the case if you said, you have now made a listing of me. You have adopted restrictive actions against me. That decision where you did that must have its legal basis somewhere. Yes, it had its legal basis in a general reg regulation, which, as a point of departure, I would say I could not have attacked before the court because it was not of individual con concern. The other problem now that it is actually most likely a, an act of uh, a regulatory act, so yes, I could have attacked it, but I wouldn't have, have thought about it at the time. So there's, a, there's a, a new issue that has not been before the court yet, whether that will, will now kick in. But otherwise, what I would want to do in the case would be to argue that the base rate regulation was defective and therefore it should be considered inapplicable and therefore the actual listing should also be, uh, be uh, invalidated for, uh, for, for that res reason. Now, what the court then said about this was, but you can't sit back and wait. If you could have raised a case against the base regulation but chose not to do so, then you cannot later come and say, now I would like to plead Article 277. You can't play a waiting game, which the treaty says nothing about, but this is, uh, this is in, in the case law. And it makes kind of sense. And that's why it becomes a potential problem that since you could now claim it's a regulatory act, then you could possibly have brought, brought a case if you could prove that you were directly concerned. Now, a little bit of help was then given with the Aquiton Beef case, uh, where uh, it was said that actually this limitation only applies if everything was very clear. And there could be the saving point of saying it was not very clear that you were directly concerned by this general base regulation that was the legal basis. And the very last issue would then be uh, what about member states? Are they subject to, to the same standard? And this is one of the areas where you will see the fact that the court does actually operate in specific cases, as Eleanor was saying at, at the beginning of, uh, of this morning, because the court does from time to time change its point of view. Sometimes, such as in the famous Café Haag case, explicitly saying, we thought about it, this was actually not correct, we will now give you the correct solution, Café Haag 1, Café Haag 2, on the understanding of, of trademarks. But here something strange happened. Originally everybody assumed that the TWD, that applied to member states as well. Then we got a ruling in, in 2004 saying, no, 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 member states are privileged applicants and therefore they are not short, uh, they're not subject to this limitation. And if you look at current textbook references, that's the case that is actually referred to. And therefore, I will end by drawing your attention to a case that was decided this year against Germany, where the court says, actually, that's not the way it is. And there are a number of cases after the Spanish case where we have already indicated this. Member states are subject to the TWD uh, limitation. If it is something that is not addressed to them individually, because then 277 would not apply in any case, if it is a general rule that they are dissatisfied with and they did not use their facilities to bring a direct action against it, then it's game over. They cannot raise it. 
uh, and they cannot raise it before the European Court, they cannot raise it before a national court either. The very last issue is a weird concept of non-existent acts, which is the, uh, the limitation that the court put in this recent German uh, decision to, to say this, however, this limitation would not apply if the act attacked was so obnoxious as to be a non-existent act. You don't find that concept anywhere in the treaties, but you find it in an old case concerning BAS, BASF, where the court says that even though we presume that EU acts are, are legal, then there are some that are so obnoxious, so incorrect, that we will simply regard them as non-existent. Exactly where that takes us is something that uh, is, is uh, uh, in many ways, something that we can say is left open. So with that, I will end my presentation, and of course, Ines will be asking you whether there are any questions. Thank you, Peter. Applause to the Peter for presentation. So, are there any questions to Peter about common foreign security policy and fundamentals? I, I, I can't help but ask still. This is, this is hugely entertaining, uh, the Thank way you. you have went through this. And, and uh, I, when I did my baccalaureate mm -hmm. 100 years ago, I, I was trying to explain how to file a case in the court of uh, first instance at the time, and yeah. what the preconditions are, yeah. and I thought I understood it, you know, direct and individual concern, and I figured it out. And then after this merger of the constitutional draft and then the final text, I gave up. Mm -hmm. I, I, I just gave up because even after the Inuit decision, uh, it was not possible to tell to law students how it goes. No. So what 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 actually is this legislative act which doesn't need whatever measures and so on? Yeah. And uh, we found one master's student who now defended a dissertation in Tartu, and she claims she understood it. <laughs> so if you want to find the truth, we yeah. will be able to find her dissertation. It's in Estonian, you'll have to translate it. But I, I shall look for it. It reminds almost of the statement accredited to, uh, to uh, the British minister, Palmerston, who said about the war between uh, Denmark and Germany in 1864, that, which concerned the duchies of Holstein and, and Schleswig in, in northern Germany, he said there are only three persons who ever understood uh, this issue. One of them is dead, the other went mad, and personally I've forgotten. Uh, and that is perhaps a possible epitaph also about the current version of Article 264. I would agree with what I hear as the implicit uh, criticism from, from, from your side, that what has been constructed was meant as a good thing, but it has become overcomplicated. Because the issue was actually quite simple. The issue stems from uh, a case where Eleanor's predecessor, uh, gave Francis Jacobs gave an excellent uh, advocate general's opinion on the problem that a group of uh, uh, Spanish uh, uh, farmers complained about some general EU rules. And of course, the elementary thing to say to them was that if they're general rules, you're not individually concerned. Game over. Uh, but they said, yes, but we have an additional problem because we cannot take this to a Spanish court, uh, because the Spanish court will tell us that's an EU rule, so, so you can't come here with it. And that means that we are now ending between two chairs, so, so, so to speak, and that must surely be a denial of justice. And that's exactly the argument that Francis Jacobs seized upon and said, yes, there must be therefore a reserve function that if the member states do not provide access to justice, then the, the Court of Justice in Luxembourg must step in insofar as EU rules are concerned. We must be flexible in our understanding of Article 2263. The Court, however, chose to say, no, we will not, uh, because our claim is you must have access to the national courts. And if they don't give it to you, then there's a breach of treaty and something should be done about that by somebody. But at the same time, the Commission is not obliged to do something. So the Commission can choose just to sit back and then the individuals are, are still lost in space. So that was the problem that was to be addressed by, by the rule. 
And then somebody became, in my mind, overcomplicated in their thinking and came up with this notion of the regulatory act. If you had asked me, but nobody did, and I, know, and I don't think anybody's going to ask me in the future, uh, it's very simple. You could just remove that restriction. You could say any individual can bring a claim against an act that is of direct concern to them. We can keep direct con con concern. That's, a, in my understanding, should be just EU speak for what we call legal interest in most other national pr procedures. So as long as you have legal interest in the case, then you could bring, bring a claim. What's to lose? At maximum, of course, well, sadly for Eleanor, more work for, for the court, but that should then, of course, be followed up by increased budgets for, uh, for, uh, for, for the court or, or whatever. But the principle of saying to individuals, no, 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 you're not privileged ap applicants. You, you shouldn't come here. You should go to national courts. And then say to national courts, oh, but you don't have jurisdiction over EU rules, so if you want to believe what the applicant is saying, you will have to send it to the court via the preliminary reference. To me, that's such an unnecessary roundabout uh, way to do things, but it's been with us since 1957, and it's, uh, there's been no move seriously to remove that limitation. And of course, I should have said, just like Inga, but I'll say it now for the benefit of the tape. Any points of view uh, given here are entirely mine uh, in an academic platform and not an expression of the policy or intent of, of the court. And Eleanor uh, would have said the same thing. <laughs> okay, any other questions? Yes, please do. Yes, I have a question. I was reading about one case uh, that uh, the daughter of uh, a Libyan this ruler, Gaddafi, yeah. did, did a litigation to, to lift the uh, sanctions of yeah. the European Union, and the, the sanctions were lifted by ECJ. Yeah. And my question is, I'm thinking of maybe more, more recent events. For example, yeah. there are after the uh, COP, uh, COP in Turkey in mm -hmm. 2014, um, I know that there are lots of um, uh, like political refu refugees going mm -hmm. out uh, yeah. out of Turkey, and the, the Turkey is um, like um, hunting them all over the world for some maybe in most of many countries. Uh, have you heard of any such litigations maybe which are about maybe some protection of such refugees? No, uh, I, I can't say that, and, but this would also be, this would be radically different from, uh, from uh, what is called the sanctions or uh, temporary restrictions regime because they are in, they're adopted against people in order to facilitate uh, the foreign policy goals of, of the European Union, such as putting restrictions on Russia or on the heads of, of the Russian military. I'm not sure how effective it is to tell the uh, chief admiral of the uh, Russian Black Sea Fleet that he cannot get a visa to visit Europe and that if he were to have any money in European banks, uh, they will be uh, taken, uh, that they'll be frozen. I'm not quite sure how much that has an impact on, on Russian policy, but, uh, but that's then my assessment, which is apparently different from that of the Council. Uh, then there is the, the next element where we've used it to, to say, typically in countries where there has been a successful coup, and we have, or a successful reversal of policy, and where we thereby have an old government of cronies that were participating in uh, absconding with money or, or abusing political power, then we want to take sanctions against them uh, in order to help with the re-establishment of law and, uh, and order. That, of course, in itself becomes a dangerous subject because then you say, are sanctions, but then surely this must follow all the norms of the European Human Rights Convention concerning protection of individuals in criminal cases. And the court has, in my opinion, somewhat disingenuously said, no, 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 these are not sanctions. These are temporary restrictions that simply facilitate that the third country's concern can take the appropriate uh, criminal uh, sanctions against these persons. 
I beg to differ, but that's because I've worked previously with that kind of case before the General Court. Uh, so what you're now mentioning, which is, should the EU not step in and help the persons that have been the subject of uh, Mr. Erdogan's retaliations, if we want to call it that, after the, uh, the failed coup in, uh, in Turkey, that could be a, pol a possible uh, policy measure for the EU to adopt, but not one that I've heard of, and something that would then require establishment once more of a separate legal basis for that in order to uh, provide such uh, assistance. And I've, I've heard of no policy plans to, uh, to go down that route. That became a long answer that could simply have said no, but I hope it gave a, a background to the no.